Hey guys, welcome back, welcome back, welcome back to the Better Not Bitter podcast. I am your host, Maya Warren, and I'm so glad that you decided to join me today. As you can see, I got on the glasses, the cap, so you know it's a migraine day, but just bear with me. Um, Before we get into it, I have a special guest, and we're going to introduce her after we drop the intro. All right, y'all. It's it's um it's a beautiful day. <laughs> it's been raining all day, and you know I'm just trying to get things together. Um, but today I have a special guest with me, a longtime friend, probably going on if not over ten years, somewhere close to that. Um, before I introduce her, I'd like to you know invite you to pull up a chair, take a seat, because today is the first installment of the blindness awareness episodes that I'm going to be doing on this channel. Uh, And so that means I'm going to need you to really like, comment, share, all those wonderful things. Please keep it respectful. And uh, I look forward to hearing some of y'all's feedback. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce my friend, Cassidy Hooper. Good evening. (laughs) What's up, girl? Yeah, I'm really excited to be here. Thanks for having me tonight. <laughs> uh, thank you for coming and accepting the invitation. It's been uh, quite some time, but uh, I'm excited to, you know, hear some of the things that you have to say. So for the audience, the people that do not have the privilege of knowing you, could you introduce yourself? Yes. So my name is Cassidy Hooper. I was born totally blind. I'm a junior here in college. And um, I was born totally blind. I was also born without a nose, something that the doctors called BAM syndrome, Bosma arrhenia microthalmia syndrome, which the microthalmia just means that there's no, there's very little eyeballs, but we tend to think that I don't have eyeballs. So, but um, let's start from the very good, uh, very beginning, a little sound of music. Uh, reference start from the very beginning because that's a good place to start so when I was born uh, my parents actually weren't really sure how I was going to make it in life they weren't sure whether I was going to have like they, they were hearing several different disabilities like Down syndrome and some of the other ones as well but they had no idea that I would be born without a nose well Long story short, uh, doctors actually built me in those. I've had a total of 19 surgeries, and that's including the stuff that I had when I was first born to have a trach put in. And those of you that don't know what that is, it's essentially a tube that goes into your throat that helps you breathe. That lasted for about a year. And to go places, it was like going on a trip. You had to pack all of the supplies with you. You had a machine, you had cleaning supplies and everything else you needed to make sure that the trach stayed nice and clean so that we didn't have any sort of bacteria get into it. Um, and then I uh, got older. Um, actually, it was crazy because, so I'm a Christian. I grew up in a Christian family. And so one of the things that my mom uh, did was after she had left the hospital, because I had to stay in NICU for a while. And when she left, she saw my dad crying. And so she was doing what she needed to do. And then all of a sudden, audibly, she hears God's voice. And he said, I've got this. And every now, like every time something comes up, either to me or to her, it's always been, I've got this. And it's just been this whole theme for the past 25 years of my life. (laughs) And so, um, so then I got older, I went to public school for a while, realized I didn't have many of the resources that I needed. I had orientation and mobility, which is basically how to navigate, um, a certain area, um, getting from point A to point B. Um, as you get older, you learn how to do bus travel and stuff. It's a lot of fun. Um, but I had that, I had Braille, but that was about it. (laughs) 
didn't have any computer skills except for keyboard. That was it. But there wasn't JAWS. There wasn't, like, voiceover to be able to read the screen for me. So when I was about 10 years old, I went to the Governor Moorhead School for the Blind in Raleigh, North Carolina, where I spent my fifth grade year all the way through my senior year of high school. And during that time was when I actually started having the surgeries to build my nose. Now, I will say this, that my nose doesn't really, I don't smell that good. Um, my sense of smell isn't very good. But from what I do, what I think I have is, is it's okay. But I can't tell you what something smells like. Because, yeah. So I can't really tell if I actually can smell or if I just think I can at this point. <laughs> Oh, wow. Let me ask you a quick question. Okay. Um, because uh, I want to ba- unpack a few things before we continue, because when it comes to blindness um, or the lack of sight, and especially with your particular condition, mm-hmm. I think it's important to unpack it for people who don't know. So yeah. um, one of the interesting things about vision or vision awareness is for those who are blind or visually impaired, depending on the spectrum, you go through something that she mentioned called orientation and mobility. Yep. Um, and I want to draw attention to that because given your condition, it, you know, as you said, like you went into Governor Moorhead without those skills and then you were able to attain those skills. And so I want to explain to people what O&M is. Yeah. So O&M is essentially dependent. It depends on your level of impairment. Um, But what happens is you have an instructor and these instructors are designed to be able to teach you and coach you through uh, safe ways to travel um, in your home, safe ways to travel outside your home, like using public transportation in your school. And they also are trained to teach you certain ways of navigating. So if you, um, depending on your level of impairment, if you have a guide dog, um, they help you learn how to get accustomed to navigating with a guide dog. But the preliminary step to having a guide dog is learning how to use a white cane. Yeah, And this is um, something that is important because if you're totally blind, that's how you essentially navigate but I argue that depending on your level of impairment using a white cane is so essential whether you have some semblance of sight or not because it gives you uh, an indicator when you're out in public so people can say hey oh she has a vision uh, issue let me help her so my question to you is what are some of the things that you learned in O&M that you still use to today and that had the most impact on you? I guess for me, it's just like learning how to memorize certain routes for one. Um, Here on campus, we have a really small campus. So I currently attend Johnson University. It's a Bible college here in Knoxville, Tennessee. And um, so essentially it's a small campus, but from what I use, I try to use um, what I can on this campus because there's accessibility wise, there are some things that could change. But other than that, like try to memorizing routes, try to trying to memorize routes. And then also going through like, um, I did a lot of escalator travel in O&M as well. So like they would take us to the mall or to the airport. They would have us travel the moving sidewalks or the escalator and learn how to do that with the cane. And I still do that to this day. It's fun. It's a lot of fun. Um, and I used, I used to be terrified of it. And now I'm just like, this is like not as bad anymore. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. And, and that kind of ties into where we paused in your story. Like, you go into government, uh, Governor Moorhead and um, just uh, learning all those skills. And to specify, for those who don't know, um, as she said, Governor Moorhead is a school for the blind, um, but a lot of visually impaired uh, students go there as well. And the teachers um, 
are specifically trained on how to teach those who are in the blind and VI community. And they tend to have a lot more access to things like um, classes for Braille and the equipment that entails adaptive technology, as well as connecting you with um, appropriate organizations, uh, yeah. given your condition. So talk about um, your experience with the Governor Moorhead School and how that's helped you now that you've been navigating college? So when I was at Governor Moorhead, it was very much, um, it was like a boarding school essentially, cause we stayed there during the week, but we would come home on weekends and they had cottage, well, uh, they call them cottages uh, where we stayed. It was an eight room facility that had um, two beds in it. And they were kind of small um, compared to, I'm pretty sure you could fit two uh, of those little, maybe one of those cottages. I think you could at least fit two of those cottage rooms, bedrooms, into my dorm room. Because this room is bigger than than those cottages, uh, cottage bedrooms. Um and from what I learned there was just kind of like a host of smorgasbord of independent living skills. Um, like how to make a bed, how to unpack a suitcase, how to organize a space, which <laughs> I still struggle with. But I mean, hey, I'm a college kid, you know. <laughs> but no, but in all seriousness, um, the, the things that I learned there... Um, I spent some time in their independent living housing, housing over there, too. So it was basically an apartment that had two bedrooms and you had your own kitchen. Um, of course, it was supervised. And we learned how to cook there. We learned how to wash clothes and towels and fold things. So we learned not only did we learn academics, but we learned life lessons. We learned how to do stuff to prepare us for uh the real world so it wasn't just an academic school but it was also how to get along in life how to make mm. friends with your peers how to do learn these independent living skills O and um stuff like that it's really been a big help um because i'm not using the stove by myself yet but i'm i'm able to do a little bit to where I, I know like a little bit of what I'm doing but mm -hmm. uh, normally my like when I'm here my boyfriend is normally helping me out with that kind of thing <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome yeah. and uh I'm glad that you mentioned independent living skills because I think um depending on your experience with vision, if you're, if you tend to be closer to 2020, I think those are things that sometimes people may take it, take for granted. Um, uh, independent living skills, just to kind of define that, because, you know, we're about definitions and, and defining and having context on this podcast is yeah. skills that um, help you navigate daily life. Some, some, in some uh, disability settings, it's even called activities of daily living. So, you know, learning how to do the essential things like ironing. I don't know if anybody else still irons. I iron. Um, learning how to differentiate between different color clothing, depending mm -hmm. on how imp impaired your vision is. Um, utilizing like tips and tricks to learn how to do things like sewing, um, uh, washing your clothes, um, just to kind of make things simpler. And I have been blessed to have met a lot of dope people <laughs> who are blind and or visually impaired who have taught me a couple of things. And we've I've taught them a couple of things. And one of the things that, you know, I'm sure you can relate to this when it comes to your condition or your level of sight, um, you get to a place where some activities of daily living, you don't even notice that you're using those particular uh, ways of navigating it because it's second nature to you. Yeah. And then, and then when you meet other people and they're like, "Oh, you can, you, you, you just said you're impaired or blind. You can do this." And I'd like you to talk about that uh, if you've had any experiences. Oh where... my gosh, <laughs> it happens all the time here. 
So wow. On campus. Yes, it happens all the time. Well, okay, here's why. I am a minority on campus. I am the only totally blind student. There is one other visually impaired, or at least like one or two other visually impaired students on this campus. But they have sight. They have a little bit of sight. Me? I have none. <laughs> the only sight that I have is the sight the Holy Spirit gave me. That's right, it. Now. And um and that's what I've got, you know? And 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 it's crazy because like I do different things like getting around on campus and they're like, You can do this? I'm like, uh, <laughs> yeah. They don't like it. It's that's so awesome. funny because like our disability person, she does not like me going certain places by myself like she just is not about it and mm. i'm just like <laughs> if i don't start somewhere when will i start you know yeah um i want to <laughs> hop on that point because so i you remember lex gillette um yes i love that so for those <laughs> yeah so guys if you don't know who lex gillette is please do yourself a favor look him up he is a blind track and field Paralympic athlete for Team yep. USA. Shout out to him. He just won silver silver in his event uh, last Ooh. month. And I have his book. Um, and his book is, ta- is called Fly because he's he specializes in the long jump. So, mm-hmm. you know. And in the book, he was talking about how um, people, like he really had to navigate different scenarios and circumstances as an athlete he talks about one instance where i believe he was he went to las vegas uh, after um not meddling in an event i believe and while he was there he was with some friends right and yeah. you know he's totally blind just for context and he uses utilizes a cane um and they were going down the las vegas strip and they stopped in a designer, a fashion designing brand. I forget it if it was Louis Vuitton or Michael Kors. And they're in the store and his friends are like, hey, check out this bag. I think you'd like it. So he he uses his, uh, you know, kinesthetic ability and he touches it, feels the texture. And his friends describe him the bag. Yeah. And so he internalized that. He was like, OK, the next day his friends leave. And they're like, are you okay? He was like, no, I, I think I want to stay one more day. So now he has to go back where that bag was because he wants to get it by himself. Yeah. And I'm not going to spoil the whole story. But in that story, he talks about having to stand there on the corner and wait for someone to kind of help him out after he purchased the bag because there was so much traffic and so many people. And um. But even after all of that, he noted he noted the experience. He was like, I wouldn't trade that experience for anything, even yeah. though it caused me to be out of my comfort zone and it was scary. I gained a level of confidence in my level of independence and in navigating the world. And so I think sometimes, well, many times people see someone with a, a vision impairment or blindness and they automatically assume, oh, well, navigating the world isn't safe for you. That's ableist, yep. first of all. Okay. Yeah. We just need different tools and, and it takes time to build that confidence. But we are quite capable. And, you know, I believe that you are quite capable of doing that. It just takes baby steps and, and sometimes leaning on other people to help us. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it also helps. Um... And I hope that this is okay to share here, but it also helps that I, I'm dating somebody that has full sight. Um, I tell you, that is a blessing. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> hold on. You don't... Girl, that is okay to share. Okay? okay. Okay. That is a beautiful thing that you have someone in your life who is sighted and who does not mind helping you out. That is a wonderful thing. So <laughs> kudos to him. <laughs> yeah. He's... He's been very supportive. He goes to school here too. And like he he's just like all about me being independent. But also like he knows, okay, I need help with certain things. Like going to get medications for different things. Like he helps with that. 
and getting to church and stuff like that. Like, it's definitely been a blessing. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. And, you know, someone in the comment was like, Lex needed to self-advocate. He did, you know, part of self-advocating, he was asking people for help in that scenario. But I yeah. will say, like, to your point, I think it's um, a beautiful thing when you can have someone in your life where you can allow them, you can let them in to your circumstance and they don't judge you for it. They don't try to tell you about your experience, but their, their presence is there and they're there to serve you unconditionally. So that's a beautiful thing. Thank you. Oh, no problem, girl. Um, so kind of tracking back, we talked about your experience with Governor Moorhead. I'm curious to know um, about how the transition from Governor Moorhead or GMS was um, to college, because I know for anybody that is a, a, a big leap. But when you have an impairment, it can be like a whole entire different experience. I will say growing up in like a world or not really a world, but like just like a place where there was just all blind people. Cause even after I graduated, I was still around them because I was um, doing the adult rehab program, the able program at the school for the blind. They have this entire um, area that is devoted to the adults who are blind or visually impaired. A lot of them lose their sight later in life. And so, um, so I went there before I even started college and I learned, I did a college prep course and, um, one of the things that stuck out to me in that course was you are the CEO of your success. You have started a company called you are the, your success and you're the CEO. And that just kind of stuck with me, um, ever since then. And really being at the, Sa uh, at the savvy program, that's how my and I met. That was a program for teens that were, you know, wanting to go into the work world or wanted to learn independent living skills and, and who wanted to, to learn about college. It was a really good uh, place for us to learn that. And, and then after that, just transitioning, I went to community college for three years. And like there, I made a few friends, got to hang out with some of them throughout that time. I still keep in contact with some of them and see some of them on Facebook, um, just their life and just being able to see how they're doing and just like transitioning from being with a bunch of blind people to now being one of the only blind people on campus, <laughs> you know? And it's just like, it was a really good thing. And I thank God for bringing me to that point because I don't want to just like put myself in a box and be like, I can only be friends with, with blind people, you know? Cause that's not, that's not healthy. You know, you gotta have friends with, you know, who are diverse. And that's really one thing that I'm really, really happy about with coming here is everybody comes from all walks of life coming to, to Johnson, where I go to school. And it's cool because you get to hear their stories and, like, just, like, just really just get to learn more about them and, and just kind of see how they grow on a day-to-day -day basis. And to be honest, like, it's been great. I was honestly nervous. I didn't know who I would be, you know, how I would be able to, like, get along with sighted friends. Like, who would actually, like, want to hang out with me. And then, like, coming here, and, you know, being in college, like, people have been very helpful, especially here. I've noticed it a lot. People have treated me the same. They haven't treated me as fragile or, like, you know, just different they treat me just like everyone else even some of the professors here um at first it was kind of hard because like people would say oh we don't want you to do this because we don't want to be liable for it mm. but that was very very short term now it's like yeah do what you want to do everybody's okay <laughs> with it like it's like yeah like <laughs> that's you know, awesome like yeah, so it's been. Let a... me. Sorry, well, I was, gonna, uh, I was gonna ask you. Uh, I was. Let me ask you a, a couple questions about what you said okay. regarding like 
Um, you mentioned the Savvy program and how that helped you. Um, yes. For those of, you know, those who don't know you, that's actually how you and I met. We both attended the Savvy program um, together yes. and we were able to hang out, have jam sessions. Yes. Um, Cassidy sings. She also yes. has a podcast. Uh, she plays piano. She's a woman of many talents. Okay, y'all. Um <laughs> And I remember being in that program, each each tier of them, uh, and just feeling like I was so prepared, even when I got into college. Um, yeah. So to hear your experience of that transition and how that helped you is a testament to how good those folks over there at the Savvy Program are at what they do. Um, my other question is, you said you transitioned from community college to where you are now. Yeah. Um, what was it like? Um, I know you mentioned kind of transitioning from an atmosphere of being around people who were all blind to people who were mostly sighted. What was it like initially, initially for you to like come out of your comfort zone and embrace that? Like, so it was really, really interesting because, um, to start for starters, the people that I met while I was there, while I didn't see them all the time, um, except for when we were in classes together, or in, like disability awareness support groups, um, you know, it was we did get to hang out outside of those areas, and even some of them I still hang out with. But there were those people that were, I would just like pass by, and they didn't really say anything, and that's fine. You know, they they have their own, you know, their own things that they want to do. And maybe they just weren't in a good mood in, in those times. And I just caught them on, you know, a bad timing, which is fine. But um, and then, like, just making those friends and then coming here to a place where a lot of people know, like, either way, like, a, a lot of people knew who I was. But it was one of those things where I, it's hard for me to tell who everybody is. Because I have to go strictly by voice, which on, for the most part I can do, but it takes me a while, especially if there's a lot of people that want to come up to me and say hello. Because that happened at my community college, and that happens here too. <laughs> um, I actually graduated with my associates back in 2019. Congratulations. That, thank you. And I got my associates in arts, and I graduated in 2019. It was a, um, it was a fun time. Um, that was, that year was fun. I will say that was that that year and freshman year were my fun years. Well, they were all fun years. Um, like the times that I had to take math classes, people helped me in that class. We had study sessions. Like my, I I have stories of like us hanging out outside of class at the one of the French bakeries, and like eating having a fun time studying or just like eating subway or whatever and like some of these people had kids but some of these people were my age but mm. yet like was still able to help me out and then like and then coming here just like having people here to help me um people take notes um and stuff and it's like really really good because i have a lot of a lot of help here yeah, you know what I hear you saying? Um, something that I, uh, my friend Casper and James, they might uh, they might be like, oh, here she goes. She got to talk about it, but I'm going to talk about it. Um, it's the idea uh, that I try to teach when I am uh, talking to people and educating people on albinism, migraine, chronic illness, uh, mm -hmm. and, and vision impairment is the idea of relational proximity. Yeah. And that essentially is you have some people, for example, who will see that you are blind or visually impaired. And not only do they assume that you, you can't do much of anything, but they literally act and they speak in that fashion without even getting to know you. Yeah. Relational proximity says, let me build a relationship with you genuinely out of the desire to get to know you and to serve you and through that 
the person who has the disability is more likely to open up to you. Yeah. And then it becomes this beautiful exchange of y'all learning from each other. And so that's essentially what your friends did during your time at, um, at your school. Like, even though they were not blind or visually impaired, they took time to build relationship with you. And instead of judging or assuming that you can't do this or that, they took the time to be with you. And yeah. sit, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Could you, could you talk about, um, just some ways that when people assume certain things about your abilities, how does that make you feel? Honestly, it, make, it makes me feel less than. Mm. And it makes it hard for me to open up to that person. I really, really difficult. Really, really difficult because it's just like, and I have to give them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe this, they've never, you know, encountered a person with a visual impairment. You know, so I have to give them that, that grace, you know, but at the same time, it's like, okay, where do we start with education? You know, like now we have a, I started a disability awareness chapel group on campus. And so different people will come every week that want to come to learn more about disabilities. We're about to get into our blindness unit, actually, on October the 11th. No, was it October the 11th or October the 13th? I can't I can't really remember. It's the 4th right now, so I think it's the 11th. Well, all of October is Blindness Awareness Month. Exactly. So you're still on point either way. <laughs> yeah, I know. It was crazy because I was going to start it in September, and then like we had like a student uh, SGA, student government kind of day where we got to go and do like community service. And then last week mm -hmm. was Missions Emphasis Week, and then this week is Middle health infants this week and so we don't have chapel groups this week so it works out perfectly that we start blindness when blindness awareness is happening you know <laughs> um, October, that's, that's awesome october 15th is actually national white cane day yes i am aware i'm i'm gonna pull out my white cane from my closet you know i'm gonna yeah. represent you know i only use it in in unfamiliar areas but um yeah it is still a vital tool like i remember using mine um on like the first couple week on my college campus mm -hmm. and like we had these buses like called the chariot and they take you around the campus to different stops and i got on there with my white cane and the bus driver was so like obliging he was like oh okay you just let me know where you need to stop and I got you. And um, that made me feel good, you know, because yeah. um, if you're totally blind, there is some indicator of you not having sight at all. But when you're visually impaired, because that, first of all, people don't understand that vision impairment is a wide spectrum. Yep. Uh, it, it's not cut and dry. I think the, the spectrum of vision impairment is wider than the spectrum of just acuity in general yeah um and so having that white cane is something i recommend to anybody who has a vision impairment that is significant enough and it, it really gives you a voice sometimes even when you don't know how to uh say certain things um i'd kind of like to piggyback off of you know you mentioning that you started that disability awareness ministry because i think that is something very important uh we need to be able to have conversations around disability with people who don't have disabilities because you know essentially we all need each other so talk about what um what encouraged you or inspired you to get the ball rolling on that ministry so when i was at community college um, one of the people that was there, uh, one of the coaches that was in the, the disability uh, services office started it, started one. And so it was me and a few others. We just kind of like did different things that related to like, and, and when she left, like, it was like, we did different things. Like we've done like mindfulness stuff. We've talked about different things. And so like leaving community college, I was like, okay, 
eventually I want to start one at Johnson. And so it was one of those things where it was like, not only is my group, uh, well, not my group, it's God's really, uh, but it's the uh, Disability Awareness Chapel group. Not only is it a support group for those that want to like come in and share, but it's also like a place where like other students can learn more about people with disabilities. There's so many. Um, uh, my other two leaders are, are in there and they have, you know, they've gotten to share their stories and it's just really, really fun to do. And what really st- got me started on it was because, um, what really started it was because my first year they did a disability awareness chapel, um, and they didn't do it last year. And I'm thinking, okay, that is such a large, well, from what I hear, it's a large minority, like, large portion of campus. And, like, that people really need to know about. And especially the education majors. Yeah, you have the class survey of persons with disabilities, but that only lasts for a certain amount of time, whereas this one's going to last for, I don't know, however many God bless us do it, you know? Mm-hmm. And so what really got me started was just like, okay, this is what I want to talk about. It was, you know, I don't remember if I really prayed about it. I thought I prayed about it some. And I just kind of felt led to, to do it because not a lot of people have experienced not just blindness, but others as well. And um, other disabilities as well. And so um, it was fun memory was when we got together and we all made stress balls a few weeks ago. So if you want to learn how to make a stress ball, it's really easy to do. You just take balloons and you take a funnel and you put either flour or rice or sand or whatever it is you want to put in it. And then you kind of like tie the, the stuff, the, the balloon hole to where like, it can't be like, Broken. Now, I will say, you can put your hole in it. Somebody actually did that. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I will not say who, but somebody actually did that. Hey, it's all right. I'm glad it you mentioned me. that, though. And I think it's so beautiful how God will put a burden on our heart that so mm-hmm. aligns with the purpose he created us for that not to say we don't pray, but it's one of those things where we just know it's him so much to the point where we have peace when we act on it. So that's that's beautiful. And I also think it's really cool um, that you've created this space for conversations and community. Um, because one of the things that <laughs> I had the pleasure, I've always had the pleasure of doing, but is self-advocating and it's not always a fun thing but it's a necessary thing exactly and i've been the person in a lot of my relationships that people can refer to because of my condition so me having albinism me being visually impaired you know me having chronic migraine disorder and hypermobility spectrum disorder me having all those things i am I view it as being a resource for people in my sphere of influence and people I have relationship with because um, I've gotten to a place where I'm like, hey, if you want to know something about X, Y, Z, just ask me. Don't Google it. I mean, like, I appreciate the gesture if you want to Google, but I think having relationship with people opens doors because then they get to to see things differently and and a lot of those misconceptions that have been put out there in the media about disability about blindness about vision impairment they start to crumble because now you have living proof of what the deal is you know and yeah and while and while everybody is different the thing that remains true is relationship 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 i can't say it enough yeah it, it, it it's over assumption over generalizations over stereotypes like and i believe there's a reason why god calls us to relationship yeah he doesn't just call us to to christianity he calls us to relationship because if you have relationship with someone not only do you recognize the value in that person but you begin to um in a good way see things with a broader lens 
Now God is on another level, but I believe he's given us relationships here on earth so that we can do that because we don't know everything. No, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why he said, if you look at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, he says, Jesus clearly says, go and make disciples. Why? So we can talk to them about, about Jesus, you know? Mm -hmm. And why, yeah. why, 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 if you look at the Gospel of John, why, you know, why did God make the blind? And why did God, you know, make the lame or the, the deaf or hard of hearing, you know? Mm -hmm. why? Because his, wor his works are displayed through them. And, you know, it's that whole passage, I forget exactly where, but it's where his Jesus' disciples asked the, the, the about the in regards to the blind man who sinned mm -hmm. him or his fa family. Even today, <laughs> say it. Even today, say it. There are people who claim to be Christian mm -hmm. who think, Oh, if you're disabled, you have sinned or your family. It is so Talk about not it. true. It is so not true. The reason. You and I are visually impaired. It's so that God's works might be displayed through him. Girl, okay, you done got me started. Okay, I was trying to chill out. You done got me started because here's the thing. When I talk to people, and this translates to, especially with invisible disabilities yeah. um, and, and invisible chronic illnesses, we are human okay we are not god yeah. we are no. not called to diagnose someone else's circumstances we are Thank called you. to evaluate and hone in on the areas where we need god the most secondly yeah. secondly um here's the thing if you look in the bible jesus did not heal everybody there were <laughs> he was within multitudes of people multitudes of people who were vying for his attention vying for his healing power but he for what his whatever in his sovereignty he chose to heal who he chose to heal yeah. but i think a lot of time in greater american christian don't we look over that because people feel uncomfortable when they are presented with something that is not the standard of normal that we have been duped into believing yeah so here's the thing. Something my mentor said, uh, shout out to Pastor Roy. He said, the reason why people struggle with comparison, why we struggle with comparison is because we don't understand that God has made us unique. And therefore, if he's made us unique, why are we trying to compare our experience, our journey to those around us? Yep. And that got me because I was like, you know what? That's what happens. A lot of people assume, a lot of people treat people with disabilities a certain way because they assume um that we can or cannot do something you know that people are faking and especially it's it's really harmful in the in the house of god and it breaks my heart when i have people i do i have several people who come to me struggling with their faith because people in the house of god have diagnosed them and yeah. or dismiss them because they did not get healed according to their plan. But if you look in, in the New Testament, Paul, when he's asking God to remove the thorn from his side three times, mm -hmm. God tells him what? My grace is sufficient for you. My power is mm -hmm. made perfect in your weakness. But check this out. If God does not remove a thorn, guess what he does instead? Hmm. He strengthens us. And in, yeah. in James in the, and in the book of James, chapter one, it says. Consider it joy when you encounter trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces patience or the fruit of perseverance. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? That yeah. you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. See, people misinterpret healing for being whole. See uh, something that Dr. Tony Evans uh, mentions in one of his re recent sermons is see Jesus or, or you can be healed, but that's only going to change your external circumstance. What yeah. God is interesting, interested in, he's interested in the whole you, 
the physical yeah. you, the internal you, the mental you, the emotional. He's interested in making us whole. And that might not look like man's idea of whole, but it's God's standard and his standard is perfect. Yeah. For sure. Poof, the girl, you, you got me. Ooh, you picked the, the, the hot topic. <laughs> So long story short, y'all, especially if you're a Christian, this is why, why I reinforce the, 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 the strategy of relational proximity, because through relationship, you are invited to be a servant, not someone who's recommending home remedies, not someone who's diagnosing someone's situation. You become in the position of a servant, which is what we are all called to do. If you lead, leave as a ser- a lead as a servant. If if you love, love as a servant. If you give, give as a servant, because that positions us to not only be um, in a place of humility, but it positions us to be in a place where we're we're constant life learners, where we can never get to a place where we know everything, but we recognize that we don't know enough, and that is enough to keep us grounded in those situations. So yeah. Thank you for mentioning that. And yeah. uh, I I also want to ask you um, a quick question about just some of the things that it can be in the church, in the world, or things that you observe. Some yeah. of the common misconceptions surrounding blindness. What are some of the most prevalent misconceptions you've experienced or heard? And take a take a moment to kind of break those down and prove why they're not true i've got a few i've got a few so one of the main ones is people like especially if they meet me for the first time um they think because i'm blind they feel the need to yell (laughs) that one's my ultimate favorite because it's like whoa hello, I'm here, I can hear you. And, like, they think that I can't hear them. And so, it, it's really funny. Somebody actually asked my mom if she knew sign language because I couldn't see. How ironic is that? <laughs> now, I could see if it was Helen Keller, you know, hand signing. And, yeah, there's that, or I'll go into a restaurant And somebody will um, ask, the waitress will ask the person that I'm with, hey, what does she want? And I just go ahead and jump in and I'm like, oh yeah, I want this. You know, I don't know if you've ever had that happen to you. Um, uh Uh-oh. Can you still hear me? Let's see. Okay. Okay. And then also, too, um, people that have, like, come to, um, to try to help me, and they have all good intentions, but the, um, thing that has been an issue was the way they've spoken to me, was if I was two, and that has really been, that's what really makes me feel less than, whether they mean it or not, you know, and again, I gotta give them grace. I don't want them to, you know. I mean, they, they, they just don't know. Hear you. And so, and I hear you on on the grace tip, but I, I've been kind of like trying to juggle this notion. Like, I, I have grace and compassion for the fact that they just don't know. But a lot of where my frustration comes in is the disrespect. Like, oh, I, yeah. I can help you if you don't know something because that's opportunity to educate you. But if you're being disrespectful, invading personal boundaries, you're not taking no for an answer. Um, yeah. That's when you have to really draw the line. Like, I've well, had experiences where people talk to me like I because I said I was visually impaired. People just all of a sudden start trying to give me an eye exam on the spot. Well, can you see this? Well, can you see that thing in the corner? Can you yeah. see this? And, you know, I've had people talk to me a certain way because I had, uh, because I'm visually impaired, I have to hold my phone, like, literally, uh, if if the audience can see, like, this is how I hold my phone, because I'm visually impaired. 
Yep. And everything is still large print on my phone, but that's yeah. in addition to all that. And I've had people talk to me strange, like loudly because I was looking at my phone like that. And I, I don't know where, you know, blindness and vision impairment became, you know, related to our hearing capabilities, but yeah. that is one misconception that's got to go. Yeah. And I get it, you know, but yeah, I think that they just need to, there needs to be more education on that, you know, and I get yeah. the whole Helen Keller thing, you know, and my, my other favorite has to be, I've actually had random people grab me and then say, Hey, can I help you? First off, little side tip for people watching, never, ever grab a blind person. They cannot see you. So if you just grab them, you will set them off. They will be startled yeah. and they will, they will probably be really, really terrified. And that's how it becomes hard for them to open up to you. Yeah. Because and it, and I'll it, say it goes back to invading personal boundaries. Yeah. Just because someone has a disability doesn't mean, you know, their wheelchair or power chair is your stool. It doesn't mean someone who's blind is your little bean bag to be throwing around. Like, even though you have, good intentions you have to be careful um yeah and on that note talk about sighted guide and how in those moments um it's important for people to kind of let you take the lead in you in them helping you so the way that sighted guide works for those that don't know the person who is being guided so myself will hold on to your elbow um I kind of do it the wrong way, and I just hold on to, like, the, the bend on the inside of the elbow, but you're supposed to hold on to the outside. Um, <laughs> not linking arm. Never do that, because it throws a person off balance. Now, sometimes I will let somebody do that, but to be honest with you, I don't like the way that feels. Texture-wise, I do not like the way that feels. I would prefer to hold on to your elbow and for you to walk in front of me. Especially when it comes to narrow spaces. Um, it, it, it's fun. Um, I'll share this with you. Walking with my boyfriend. Uh, he's still learning how to go through narrow spaces with me. And I feel like sometimes when the door closes on, on me, he gets a little upset with himself. And I just have to tell him, it's okay, you're learning. And I feel like I haven't really done good trying to teach him. Um, but we're getting there. We're getting there. He's learned a lot. And so not just him, but others. Well, let me just say, like, I think it's a, a really dope thing that he's even taking action and allowing you to teach him. And there's going to be mistakes. Like I remember in the savvy program, um, we had this activity um, where if you had some level of sight, um, they gave us a blindfold. And yep. <laughs> we got to go through the exercise of what sighted guide is. Y'all, let me tell you, okay? If you want to experience maybe uh, five minutes of just terror and like, you know, feeling like you're in a completely different space and place, put on a blindfold and have someone else giving you sighted guide um, because now you are trusting them. Um <laughs> You may have your cane or your dog, depending on your, your situation, but tr putting trust in someone, like, that's another level of just <laughs> of independence that I, I really have respect for. And so one of the things that I was really grateful for during my time at Savvy is I was trained how to use the side of God. So yep. being able to, to, you know, give the appropriate, you know, cues and, and you know, adjust when there's uh narrow places but if you're not used to that it's 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 definitely different but i think when you love someone and you care for someone you don't mind accommodating yeah well i think too um it's like i remember doing that they've actually here on campus have showed so the pe person that leads the heads up the disability awareness, the disability services department slash academic support has looked up videos on sighted guide. And that's how people have learned who helped me to get around. 
who uh, work in the, in the academic support. And that's how they've learned to help me. Now, uh, certain times, a lot of times, I just go by myself unless I'm with my boyfriend. And then I'll just cling on to him because, well, I can. Um, <laughs> but other than that, like, I try to walk as independently as I can so I can learn these routes. Um, because I won't learn unless I try, you know? Um, and so there's that aspect of it, but also too, Maya, I don't know if you've seen on Facebook where he and I mm-hmm. have really, um, traded places. I, oh, really? Yeah. Go check out my Facebook. Um, there, I gotta see this. There's a video of, it was, uh, actually the day before we all left to go home for the summer. I had learned the route to the cafeteria so much so that I could walk it without using the cane if I really wanted to. You go, girl. And and so I did that, and I was like, ooh. So he and I came up with this idea (laughs) where he was going to learn how to use the cane, and he was going to use his mask as a blindfold, and we were going to walk that route, okay? But so we did that, and what I didn't plan for was him grabbing onto my arm and me guiding him. <laughs> I had this boy running into golf carts. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> but he, he enjoyed it because I really feel like it <laughs> opened him up to, to just knowing what it's like to be blind. We go. So my favorite thing is to go through a car wash So, a little bit during the time that he and I drove to the car wash last week, he closed his eyes Mm. to just feel what it was like in my shoes. We went to a place in Asheville called Max Patch, and I tell you, there comes a point where it's all gravel road, and it is bumpy as all get out. So, we're back, and luckily, he wasn't driving, so he was able to do this. We were sitting in the back seat. Somebody else was driving. And he closed his eyes so that he could feel what it was like to drive on those kind of roads with a blind uh, with, when when you're blind. That's awesome. Yeah, he's done a lot of that. And, and I think that's a beautiful thing when somebody's like willing to do the smallest thing to kind of feel what it's like to be in your shoes. And that made me think about something. Yeah. Um, and you know, for those of us who are visually impaired we don't even notice how well we've accommodated ourselves. Um, I was talking to some of my friends and I was like, my hearing is so like my hearing, my sense of smell, my sense of touch and my sense of taste overcompensate for what I don't have in terms of vision to the point where I can be in the car. And even though I have some semblance of sight, it is distance wise. Um, it, it ain't it. And so I can be in the car and I can feel just by the way the car moves when we're home in certain places where we are. Um, and especially like I'm the person in my family. I don't know if you experienced this, that I can hear and smell things. Other people that other people won't hear or smell. They're like, yeah. I don't smell it. And then 10 minutes later, Oh, I do smell it. I'm like, I told you so. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the same way when it comes to my mm-hmm. sense of hearing. Like people won't hear. Yeah. Um, luckily, we don't get this a lot, but we do get this sometimes. Uh, mm-hmm. My boyfriend and I will be driving on the road, and there'll be like an ambulance. Like something happened. Yep. I don't know if it's the same one, or if I was hearing a phantom one, basically where I thought I was hearing it. We're on our way to church mm-hmm. on Sunday morning, and like I hear the siren, but I'm like, but it's not getting any closer. But then five minutes later, I hear the siren that's, like, up close. And it's like, what? Was I predicting that? Because, like, sometimes, I don't know if you've ever done that. Yep. Think Happens you to me things. all the time. Yep. And I can, I can literally. Like- yeah, and I'll be in the car. And it, it's almost directional hearing, too, because I'll be in the car and I'll hear the yep. siren. I'm like hey, we might want to pull over because it's coming on the, the left side of the street or it's coming from that end. And they're like, you heard that? And I don't think anything of it, but I think that's kind of like, it's the goodness of God where yeah. he gives us strength 
in other areas and in the one area where we we were able to you know use assistive technology um uh, interdependence uh self advocacy um so it it's definitely a journey um and an experience for me um last question or or mm -hmm. last last thing i want to mention is I want to give you opportunity to talk about some of the the cool things that you've been able to do, like meeting certain notable people, going certain awesome places. I'm not going to give it away, but talk about some of those experiences and how they came about. And, you know, because if y'all don't know, this girl's been on TV quite a bit. So <laughs> yeah, I have. I've been on the news several times um, just because of my story, um, especially when it was surgery time or when graduations would happen um, and stuff like that, or when I was working at an amusement park, when I got that job, like, yeah. And then coming here, um, it, it was just like, people have like the news in my, in my hometown, they have been following me since I was 11. And so I've gotten to, to be able to be, you know, around them a whole bunch and not, you know, I actually made friends with some of the news anchors, or at least one of them, who's ran my story. And um, I was actually a part of a motorcycle rally for several years um, that was for kids with, like, different chronic illnesses, different disabilities, and stuff like that. Well, the last year that I was there, that I rode, some of you who might be watching might be a little older, so you might understand. Um, you might know who I'm talking about. There was a band back in the 80s called Poison. Okay? Now, their lead drummer, or not their lead drummer, but their drummer is a stage four cancer survivor. Okay? Stage four. You'd think, what? Talk about a miracle from God. This man has lived through stage four cancer. Like, what? And so he was there and he rode during that ride on his motorcycle. Well, I got to meet him at the after party and he's like, oh yeah, we're, we're playing tonight. Would you guys like to get tickets? And we're thinking, what, what, what? <laughs> and I didn't really listen to them a whole bunch, but I was like, wait, an 80s band and a drummer? Like what? <laughs> So I got to go to that concert that night, but I also got to meet the entire band and then go to next week's concert in Cherokee, North Carolina. Like, wow. so that's been fun. I got to meet, so we're talking about pastors and uh, notable people. Well, a couple years ago, I had the opportunity of meeting uh, Priscilla Shire. And her brother, Anthony Evans. Anthony Evans is a gospel singer, but he does a lot of covers to different te contemporary Christian music. Like, uh, Raise a Hallelujah is one of them. So will That's I one of my Evans. favorite covers. <laughs> yeah, I love that one. He did a cover of So Will I as well. Yes, oh. I love that one too. His, let me tell you, the Evans family is just, God bless them. <laughs> I know. And they were really nice. They both of them were really nice. And so, like on my profile picture, one of them, you'll see a picture of Priscilla on my picture because we actually got to meet them. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. She was here in Tennessee, and like, it was praise the Lord for providing for that because I had no idea. I thought it was just going to be my roommate going with our friend. But no, she had an extra ticket, and so I was able to go to it. And so I got to meet her, and it was really fun. I, I, I really encourage you guys to watch some of the Kendrick Brothers movies. She's in them. War Room is one of my favorite ones. Overcomer. And if you haven't seen, I can only imagine it's not by Kendrick Brothers, but she is in that one, too. Yes. So, wow. Those are some dope experiences that you've had. I know you've had many um, and I just appreciate, you know, you being vulnerable and taking time to, to join us today, the Thank Better you. Not Bitter family. I have one last question that I ask all of my guests. All right. And that is, 
what or who in life has helped you to become better and not bitter? Ooh. Well, first I've got to say God has really helped me. Um, for sure. And just like my family at home, as well as the people here at school. Um, because of my condition, I'm not going to go into too many details because it's like really, really personal, but because of my condition, um, I'll just share this. I've had really low bone density. And so essentially if I don't, you know, start taking something for that, my bones could be like really thin to the point where they, there could be breakage if not taken care of. Well, I had this thing of, like, I don't really want to go on medication. I don't want to take meds. I don't want to take meds. And so when I found this out, like, my boyfriend was there for it. And, like, praise the Lord, because I started crying because I didn't want to go on this meds. Because I didn't know what it was going to do. I didn't know how it was going to feel. And so just, like, having God, like, and I go back to the... the I've got this uh, statement that God told my mom. That is the same thing. It wasn't audible, but I could feel it. Mm. That is That's exactly awesome. what God told me last week when I found out that I had to start taking medication. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Wow. For sharing all that you have shared and again, spending time with us on the podcast today. I really <laughs> enjoyed it. Felt like we caught up for over the last 10 years, yeah. um, which is a great thing. I want to give you an opportunity to um, share any projects or where people can find you on social media, mm -hmm. what you're up to before we close. Let's see. So I do have a podcast called Disability Awareness. It's on Anchor. Um, it's on Google Podcasts. I will say I don't really have a whole lot up there right now because I keep forgetting to upload stuff, but I'm going to start uploading stuff soon. So you guys will be able to look at that. Um, actually, Maya, I think eventually I want to get you on there. Oh, girl. Hey, you just called me. I'll come. Yeah, it'll be a lot of fun. It'll be a lot. of. I want to get you on there. And what are the other guests that you've had on here before? Um, OK, yeah, I know who you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You've. Yeah. Her. She, I tell you. Yeah. Yeah. She's amazing. Both of you guys are amazing. Thank well, y'all. It has been a great episode. I appreciate each and every last one of y'all interacting with me in the chat. Um, your, your dope comments, sharing your experiences. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share this video with anybody you feel that it, it resonates with. Um, and without further ado, live each day to become better and not bitter. And, and I will all, see you. Let's all go make hmm? disciples. I said, let's all go make disciples. Amen. And I will see you next time.